Okay, um, if everybody's back in the room, uh, we're going to start our uh, second panel discussion uh, on administration, the future of sport and technology. And we have uh, three guests with us, uh, fine gentlemen all. So let's uh, introduce you to them. Uh, first, first of all, we have uh, Tim Palmer. Stick your hand up, Tim, and say hello. There he is. Hey, Simon, nice to meet you, and, and uh, you hello to everybody as well. You too. Uh, University lecturer Tim at the ACPE, lectures in sports business and sports coaching. He's also assistant technical director of the Northwest Sydney Football Association, and he works on the coaching staff as a video analyst and uh, also strength and conditioning uh, for the Australian para Roos as well. Um, Tim started writing about football in 2010 when he was only 16 years old. That makes me feel very old, Tim, um, because he says he enjoyed making sense of football matches. He started a blog called Australia Scout, um, which received acclaim from, among others, Ange Postacoglu, former Socceroos coach. Uh, and uh, he now has a new site for well, as new as 2016, called Tim Palmer Football, uh, which uh, succeeded Australia Scout. Uh, we also have uh, with us Scott Collis. Say hello, Scott. Hello, everyone. Wearing the horrible Liverpool shirt, um, which I don't like, <laughs> but he is the general manager of Liverpool FC International Academy in New South Wales. He's held that position since uh, 2016. Prior to that, he was the GM of the Southern Cross uh, Football Centre, um, he has an MBA from uh, Southern Cross University. He's been involved in an admin roles in both club football and youth football development uh, for over 20 years as both a volunteer and a, a professional, although he began his career working in banking. But I reckon that's probably good if you work in football administration, being able to count all the pennies. Uh, and now, of course, uh, as mentioned, he works uh, for Liverpool FC, their international academy. And uh, last but by no means least, we also have with us uh, Murray Elborn. Say hello, Murray. Hi, Simon. Hi, everyone. There he is. Good to see you, Murray. He's the CEO of Disability Sports Australia, formerly CEO of Blind Sports New South Wales and Disability Inclusion Manager for Sports New South Wales. Uh, he was also captain of the Australian goalball team for 10 years. That's extraordinary. Uh, between 1992 and 2002. Um, and then became the national head coach of uh, the Goldball youth team, a position he held for six years. He has 30 years experience uh, within the disability sports sector as athlete, coach and uh, administrator. Uh, welcome to you all, uh, gentlemen. It's very good to see you. Um, we've got about uh, 45 minutes for this chat. And uh, please, if you've got questions, anyone in the audience, then either put them in the chat or at the end of the session, um, stick your hand up, turn your video on and stick your hand up and tell us you want to ask a question. We like to have a bit of uh, interaction on these things. So I'm going to start off, uh, guys, with uh, the first question that I, I, I threw to Julie and Stacey in the previous segment, and it did Matt as well. Uh, what was your experience like growing up in sport and how did you get involved in your current role? We'll, we'll start with uh, Tim, I think. Off you go, Tim. Yeah, I mean, th thanks for the introduction again, Simon. And, and I must laugh when you say that I make you feel young because I don't know if you remember, but when I was 16 and I first started writing, I actually joined you in the commentary box for a A League game. And, uh, Me too. <laughs> and, and um, I don't know if that makes you feel any younger, maybe. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, that that was such a, a foremost moment for me in terms of what I wanted to to do in terms of working in sport and being part of football which I'd played for many years but not very good at it to be honest um so I definitely pretty quickly figured that I needed to work in coaching if I was going to have any chance of working with a career um so I after I finished school I took up coaching quite quickly um was working with a number of different teams and school programs as well um before I ended up at Northwest Sydney Football, which is also known as Spirit FC, and we've recently amalgamated with Koalas FC as well. And uh, so I've progressed in coaching roles there to my current role where I'm in a leadership position overseeing particularly the youth development site. And uh, I really enjoyed that because there was also a period where I was doing some work with the 
Socceroos under, under Ange Postacoglu as an analyst and I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong, I really, really enjoyed it, but I very quickly realised it wasn't quite my passion to be in that high performance space with the senior team, but more working with young players and helping them on their development journey. So that's where I became quite passionate about that. And that's where I also ended up working with the Paris because my experience with the national teams, I felt I had something to offer in a different space. And again, because of my own personal interest, that inclusion and diversity space was really important to me, especially because I am profoundly deaf as well myself and have competed in disability sport. So being able to contribute to a national team that is um, part of that, that space was really important to me. So I guess, I guess that's a sort of an explanation of where I've ended up right now. Great stuff. It was a good one too, Tim. Um, Scott, over to you. Simon, it's great to have an intro from you that that uh, enabled you to give a crack at the Liverpool shirt. <laughs> I never miss an opportunity. Uh, no, you know. no. Bitter Man City fans. You've done everything. You should be you should be open and you've got to get the big one this year. That's yeah. that's the uh, that's yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, for me, like most. Uh, most Aussie kids start growing up in country areas. It was all sports. It was, it was football sort of gradually won out as the passion, but you, you were involved in pretty much anything that was going. Um, we moved around a lot when I was a child. So sport wasn't just about an activity. It was really about identity. So moving to a new town, it, it gave me a place to be and a sense of, sense of who I was in a new community. So football um, became you know, really entwined with what I thought about myself and and who I was. Uh, I think getting into the professional, um, working in it professionally, again, like I think what a lot of the experience would be with people working in, in football, particularly uh, it, it came from a volunteer background and I've probably done almost every volunteer role in a, in a grassroots sport environment um, and then uh, you mentioned that we're coming from a finance uh, background, I, there was an opportunity for me to, that I thought I could use my professional experience to, to, to solve a problem, to, to, to add something positively. Uh, and uh, that led to a role with Southern Cross University and, and from there into this, this role where I'm working with Liverpool Football Club. Terrific. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Murray, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and back then there wasn't a lot of disability sport too, uh, too. <laughs> happening. So it's, uh, you know, it was uh, played mainstream sport as a child um, in school, uh, played rugby and basketball uh, predominantly. And, um, and I was born with um, scarring on both corneas um, in both eyes. And uh, so had limited vision, um, but didn't really know what that meant um, as a kid. So, uh, so played mainstream sport, was a sport nut, um, loved all sports in Australia. Uh, and uh, then when I developed cataracts at the age of uh, 12, uh, on top of my scarring on my corneas, my sight decreased quite dramatically. So the useful vision that I had um, really went downhill and, and pretty much went to 2% vision um, within two years. And so I had to quickly pivot uh, from playing mainstream sport in high school uh, and being part of, you know, the rugby and the basketball team to then uh, start to look at um, you know, adapted sport opportunities. And so started playing uh, vision impaired cricket, um, was lucky enough to become the vice captain of the New South Wales team, um, playing multiple national championships um, for New South Wales and, uh, and then discovered the sport that I would love um, it called goalball and the Australian coach and the captain of the Australian team at the time came down to a summer camp with Vision Australia um, that I was at um, with friends and uh, tried goalball for the first time and just fell in love with it. It's, uh, it's a bit of a crazy game. It's, I, I describe it like reverse dodgeball. Um, only you, you dive in the way of the ball for a start and the ball weighs 1.25 kilos. <laughs> and just to make it a little bit more difficult, we put a blackout ski mask blindfold on you so you can't actually see the ball coming. Um, so, and that ball gets thrown at about 80 kilometres an hour. Uh, so imagine uh, diving in front of a ball at 80 kilometres an hour with a blindfold on and not being able to see where you're about to get smashed. Uh, it's a pretty brutal game. <laughs> and hopefully your students and people on the call today got to see a bit of the, the goal ball uh, with the Australian women's team um, in the Paralympics 
that was televised live on Channel 7 when they played the Paralympic champions. Um, so great coverage by Seven during that. But, um, yeah, after I started um, playing, you know, then I just developed and um, was lucky enough to be selected for the New South Wales and the Australian squads. Um, played my first international in uh, China, in Beijing, um, in 1994. Uh, walked into the stadium and there were 90,000 uh, fans in the stadium uh, for the opening ceremony of the Asia Para Games, which was an amazing thing. Um, I captained uh, my country at a World Cup in Brazil in 2002 in Rio. Um, and then just loved the game, moved to the United States, um, got married. My wife's American um, and I coached at Cal State. Um, university um, and, and continued to play um, for California uh, during that time and came back to Australia in 2010 and started coaching the Australian men's team and then the Australian youth teams and our youth girls won the World Cup um, with me as the head coach in Budapest in 2017 and it's Australia's only um, world championship or Paralympic uh, medal um, which was fantastic that we were able to beat Russia in the final, um, and, and a lot of those girls have now gone on to play for the Australian women's team, uh, and uh, and now and obviously as an administrator um, of the CEO of Disability Sports Australia, we're just doing uh, phenomenal things, and um, a lot of people might have also seen in, on KO and, and Foxtel the uh, Wheelchair Rugby Australian Championships last year, so uh, we run wheelchair rugby in Australia um, as Disability Sports Australia. So if the ball is thrown that fast and you're actually trying to get in the way of it, are broken noses and black eyes just part of the part of the game? If you're a really bad defender, Simon, but technique <laughs> is everything <laughs> with the ball coming to you like that. So you push into the ball and you meet the ball and you have your, your top arm up in front of your face, hopefully. Um, you have about, it, at a Paralympic level in the men's competition, you have about 0. 0.2, uh, sorry, 0. 0.45 of a second. So just less than half a second to react to the ball hitting you from the time that the ball is coming. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty uh, unique game for sure. Hmm, it sounds it. I don't think I'll be taking that up. <laughs> Probably um, a wise move. Yeah, let's, uh, let's broaden it out a little bit more generally. Um, I'll go back to you, Tim, uh, to start us off on this one. Uh, what have been the challenges within your role over the last 18 months, given the, the global pandemic specifically, obviously, and how have you managed to over, overcome them, if indeed you have? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, it's also, it's interesting to hear Murray's experience and someone who's so well-versed in disability sport, given sort of, I think we would have very similar experiences over the past couple of years, working in this Paralympic sports space. And uh, if I speak specifically about my experiences with the Paris, which is the National Paralympic Football Team, and just to clarify, there are two versions of Paralympic football. We've got the fibre side, which is for vision impaired, um, which we would have seen at the Paralympics, um, with uh, Brazil doing a fantastic job of flattening everybody before them in that tournament. And then we've got seven aside, which wasn't included in the Paralympics for the first time in Tokyo. Uh, but that's a seven side version, which I'm involved with, that's for people with cerebral palsy, acquired brain injury or stroke. So all three of those disabilities result in motor impairments. Uh, and in our sport in particular, there's a classification system which uh, ranks players on the severity of their impairments. And then there's certain numbers that you need to achieve to have an equal playing field in the sport. What's interesting about seven aside is aside from the numbers, there's actually no offsides. So the game itself is very different in the way it's played. Um, and there's uh, some very interesting uh, tactics that have definitely used in the game because of that. But from our personal experience of what's happened over the last two years, I think the biggest probably challenge was that we were supposed to go to Spain last year to compete in the World Championships. And obviously that wasn't on the table because of the restrictions on travel. Postponed again to this year, but then of course uh, we weren't going anywhere still. So that's now being postponed to May next year. And I think that while obviously not being able to compete in those tournaments is, is problematic, a wider issue is perhaps more that we haven't even been able to get together for training camps and, and meet as a squad because we've got players from Queensland, Western Australia, Adelaide, all over the country. And those training camps are a great opportunity to not only develop the current squad but also bring in new players and we simply haven't been able to do that for two years. Um, and that when you compare to where the Paris, for example, we're currently ranked number nine in the world, but the top eight have all been training regularly 
because of the funding that's available for them and the resources that's available for them. So that jump for us to go from top nine to hopefully into the top eight and third is really challenging for us now because of that limited contact time. And I guess while we do the traditional, you know, Zoom meetings and, and technical sessions on Zoom and encouraging people to put their cameras on and all that sort of thing, it can't replace that intimate training camp environment. And so we're very lucky that Football Australia provided some opportunities for us to get together once more um, early this year before the New South Wales lockdown hit. In fact, we were actually in camp when the lockdown was announced, so we had to quickly rush everybody home. Uh, but fingers crossed now that if things are opening up a bit more, we can sort of get together a couple of times before we then head off to, to Spain in May next year, all things considered. And Tim, am I right in saying that uh, Football Australia has recently sort of returned to the party when it comes uh, to the, the Pararoos? Because for a while there, there was no funding, I think, for the Pararoos. Is that right? Yeah, so there was a period where the predominant source of funding was from the um, AIS and the Australian Sports Foundation. Um, and then for, for a variety of reasons, that funding was withdrawn. And the great part about all of that was that there was sort of two major contributors. One was, as you said, Football Australia coming on board and, and really supporting the team. And we're very lucky now to have a lot of their support in terms of competing in tournaments and getting together for training camps. And then also we've, we've got a number of <clears throat> very generous benefactors and donors who do a lot of fantastic work to support the team. And I think to, to further accentuate the challenges we've had over the last two years, naturally with, with donors and, and fundraisers, that's only possible if people see the team in action. And without actually being able to get on the pitch and have people viewing us and being exposed to who, who we are and what we do, it's very challenging to bring those sort of donations in. So we've got that challenge to, to grapple with as well. Every team needs to play, simple as that. Um, Scott, same question to you. Well, I think for, for me, my where I've seen the impact has been mainly around obviously not being able to get on the park. Um, for the, the people who are here today, Liverpool Football Club's International Academy program is run in around 30 different locations around the world. It's a, it's a junior football development program, um, which also focuses heavily on coach development. Uh, for, for me personally, the impact has been in the last 18 months has seen me wind down a program um, that was previously running, then come to Sydney to commence a new program, do the getting that up and running and then putting a pause in place um, for hopefully starting again now that we're on the other side of, of, of the restrictions. Uh, and, and that's really presented challenges. The, the clear challenge, of course, is, is you know, no players on the park and, and the, where that, where that uh, sort of flows through is, is how do we stay connected with coaches and players? How do we keep people uh, engaged and involved and um, using technology to, uh, to try and do that, to try and keep that sense of connectivity? Because I think we've seen... And certainly, uh, this is a question I, I, when I saw that we were going to be talking about today, I raised back at the club and just to get their thoughts on. And you know, they've they certainly see that never, never before has it been more important from a mental and physical point of view to 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 you really see the benefit of what you do in the junior space um, and uh, that feeling of belonging of being part of something is 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 uh has been necessary to to really rely on on technology to try and fill the gap while we were while we were out uh, we'll come on to technology and, and explore that a little bit more in a moment um before i go to uh murray scott i want to just ask you a follow-up question with regards to um academies in in general now you work for liverpool I guess that will be classed in Australia as an independent academy outside of the, the official system. There's an awful lot of these academies, and I see that, um, that there's a, another attempt to sort of try and bring them all under one umbrella and, and sort of get some sort of regulation. Mm. What's your view on, on that landscape in Australia? Is it too ad hoc? Do we need a licensing system? Because... Some of the academies are very, very good. I'm, I'm sure yours is, is one of those. But there are others that are probably more designed to um, take money away from parents um, without necessarily delivering what they say on the tin. Is that, is that a fair assessment? 
Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think um, there's, there's issues both uh, for those private operators that are outside of the official sanctioning within Australia and also, you know, those with, you know, inside the tent, so to speak, in this regard. Um, but from my point of view, yes, absolutely. I'd love to see that there was some way of, of recognising those operators who are, who are doing things in a way that is, um, you know, strong from both a, an ethical point of view and a technically and tactically and, you know, social and mental development. We're quite unique with ACPE in terms of Liverpool International Academy programs around the world in the, with an AC, ACPE's teaching expertise and resources that we have a real education focus. And, I, you know, I'd be very very confident that what we offer is on the on the stronger side of that but i only see benefits for both the consumer and football overall if we're at a point where we could have a a way of recognizing those operators because at the moment it's very difficult to for an outsider to, to tell the difference you know and i've seen even in the last few months in sydney there's been some new players pop up um with a with a brand attached to them and, and, you know, offering, we're going to be your talent ID pathway to playing professionally in Europe, you know, which is, is clearly not the case. And, and, uh, and, but, and it, but it detracts from all of us, that sort of operation. Uh, Murray, on to you, I guess you probably experienced some uh, similar things as, uh, as Tim over the last 18 months. Yeah, I think um, something we've we've felt it from both ends of the spectrum um, leading into a Paralympic Games, which was already kind of um, put back a year. Uh, it, it was difficult from both an athlete's point of view from an experienced athlete who had to train an extra year um, in an environment where they weren't able to often compete internationally. Uh, also, for younger athletes coming through, um, the ability to get an extra year was an advantage in some cases. Um, and for the first time, actually, in our wheelchair and rugby team, uh, we had a female um, athlete uh, qualify for the team as it's a mixed sport. Not, not many people know that. Um, but that was great to see. And, and Shay from Victoria um, performed really well, had a lot of court time uh, in Tokyo. And, uh, and that was really great to see as well. So there was, there was those aspects. And then obviously from a, a business aspect, trying to host Australian championships, um, which were often delayed or cancelled. Uh, it is definitely a challenge with our state and territory members. Um, but then from a participation point, uh, you know, kind of this two-year cycle of, of two big COVID events, um, we've seen the disability population of 4 million people in Australia uh, really isolated during that time and not being able to be active at all, um, not had the opportunity to go to a gym, to, you know, go for a walk in the park with somebody in oftentimes um, because of, uh, you know, community workers and support workers not being available um, to assist those people. And so you know, Disability Sport Australia have had an opportunity to really kind of take a step back and look at how we influence that space. And um, we've, we've come up with what I think is a really positive program in the National Referral Hub, uh, working with uh, healthcare providers, including physios, occupational therapists and exercise physiologists, um, teachers in education, um, and then in the NDIS system um, with community support workers uh, to be able to refer people um, with disabilities to Disability Sports Australia. And then we'll work with sports industry um, to be able to look at opportunities for them to link them to programs across the country. Um, and I would say that that probably wouldn't have happened if COVID didn't happen um, because it's kind of business as usual a lot of the time when you just work day to day through your strategic business plan. But this has enabled us to pivot a little bit and look at this bigger picture solution, which I think will be really powerful coming out of COVID and both state and federal government are really behind this initiative and, and this program. And um, to the point where we're looking to extend the Active Kids program in New South Wales to include adults with disabilities and do a trial in that space um, with a voucher system to support adults with disabilities becoming more active more often and that opens up participation greatly. So there's some exciting initiatives happening um, over this period of time, but there's also obviously been some significant challenges. I'm pleased you mentioned the word business there. I just want to pick up, before we move on to talk about technology, for disability sport in particular, I know Tim said, you know, they, they rely a lot on, on donations um, 
And I guess volunteers are a big part of the equation as well. Um, and that you know, goes for able-bodied sport too. And during a global pandemic, a lot of people have lost their jobs or seen their income reduced. Uh, therefore, I would imagine, and I'm asking a question here, um, businesses, I wouldn't say more, more reluctant to get involved with disability sport, but it's harder, it's been harder for them through a pandemic because they're losing money as well. So they've got less discretionary spend uh, to give to the likes of, uh, of disability sport and other things. Is that, is that fair? It's very fair, Simon. It's a really good point. Um, what we've seen is uh, the, the sometimes the first people to go in a state or a national body um, are, the, are the inclusion officers. And, um, and then, you know, funding that was allocated for adaptive equipment or adaptive gameplay um, training um, goes away as the first point. So that's, again, why um, we as the peak body for disability sport in Australia need to be able to step up and really advocate quite heavily, but also find alternative um, alternatives for those sports that are going through that. So um, as an example, the National Rugby League um, just onboarded with us last week um, and we'll work with the National Rugby League to reconfigure and work with them on what rugby league in the disability space looks like holistically. We do the same thing with AFL as an example. Um, and so there's an opportunity for us to be able to hold the hand of mainstream national and state sporting organisations and take them back through that journey where we're a partner um, long-term in a sustainable process for them uh, to be able to rebuild the disability sports space. So that's an exciting opportunity. Um, and uh, again, Sport Australia has been fantastic and I work very closely obviously with Sport New South Wales and the New South Wales Office of Sport and the Minister for Sport um, in New South Wales for that purpose. Okay, um, Tim, so let's talk a little bit about technology. Um, how has technology allowed you to adapt to some of the challenges in your role that you've faced over the last 18 months? Has that, has that been a real uh, bonus to come out of all of this? Yeah, I think so, for sure. In terms of we've definitely been able to recognise new ways of engaging the players and, and really sort of trying to bring them together, not only as a team, but then also to develop their, their individual skills and fitness as well. So I guess in my role specifically as a strength and conditioning coach, um, something that we were able to do very quickly at the start of the lockdown period was to, and this goes back to 2020, but what we did was we invested in a specific app for the team where we could deliver programs directly to them and we individualized that for each player to keep them physically engaged. And along with that was actually the creation of a lot of content in terms of video and text that we provided to them as well to help educate them about their physical fitness. Because we find often in this space, um, a lot of these athletes don't have experience with uh, you know, maintaining a healthy lifestyle or being able to push themselves in terms of high performance. So we spent a lot of time putting those content, that content together and that's actually been really valuable now to almost have that nice database of exercises that are relevant for this particular population, for how we can structure training programs individually when they're, in a, when they're away from a training camp in the future. So I guess from a strength and conditioning perspective, that's been really helpful. The other part of my role is I'm, I'm an analyst as well. So we, we have a lot of video footage, in fact, it sounds a bit odd to say, but when we went to the World Cup last time, we were the only national team filming all the other games. So I'm pretty sure that we're the only team in the world to have all this footage of all the different CP football teams. So what we've done over the lockdown period, we actually database to all of those. So now we've got basically an archive of the video clips of every player that plays CP football uh, internationally, which is a really nice bonus when it comes to scouting them and hopefully beating them at next year's World Cup. Um, Scott, uh, the pandemic for me as a technological philistine has meant um, just being good at Zoom, but <laughs> I guess that's a very basic thing. And uh, I would imagine you're sort of similar to vintage to me. Uh, have you had to learn a whole load of new stuff uh, in order to, to make best use of technology with, when you can't meet people face to face? I can, I can imagine that Mike's probably laughing to himself here because I had to... Uh, I had to really learn a few extra tricks over the last little bit, but I, I, I think uh, definitely necessity that has been the mother of invention or if not invention, it's got people comfortable with technology that they may not have been using often enough to get comfortable with. 
it's interesting listening to Murray talk about there being an opportunity to pivot and certainly at a at the club level, um, the feeling is that yeah, whilst nothing replaces what we do on the park, um, there's we've we've really learnt more about um, being able to uh, engage with players in a different context and develop the, the use of those to, tools from a provider's end and the comfort of using them from the consumer's end and and making it more of a blended experience, which I think is going to be something we'll see more of going forward. Um, Murray, I want to ask you, I know that in, in my job, part of the knock-on effects of, of the pandemic has been, as a commentator, I've, I've done a lot more games remotely. Uh, I've actually called off this laptop games in South Korea and uh, the Northern Territory and Queensland, which is amazing, really. It's fantastic. But it, for me, we, we've maybe lost something a little bit because we're losing that human contact uh, I personally I much prefer to be at the stadium where I can speak to people see the bigger picture what, what's your view on on technology as it's developed through this pandemic we're all having to use it more and more but is it replacing some things that should be really irreplaceable I think it's true um, that uh, people really do have um Zoom meeting fatigue um, at the moment, and we've seen it um, a lot. And being in the disability space, there's nothing like actually being face to face with someone and really, you know, talking about these these issues and these challenges and how we can solve them together. I would say though that um, you know we have invested in technology during this time, and so to be able to get the National Referral Hub project off the ground, um, we've had to rebuild our um, data capture network. And for a long time in the disability space, it was kind of very ad hoc. We'd send somebody through to an organisation, maybe a state member, um, and they'd work with someone uh, to be able to build a pathway. But often in disability sport, those pathways were top down and we didn't have feeder clubs or work very much with community sport uh, clubs in, the, in their own right. This in it has enabled us to build a really strong sales force back-end data system um, to be able to capture data, to be able to understand which community sports clubs around Australia and in New South Wales, obviously, want to be in the disability space, how we can teach adaption and inclusion through an online certification model. Um, and so, again, that, that pivot and the delivery um, through technology has helped us. But I would agree with you, in, in many instances, there's no replacement for that face-to-face. -face. Um, I remember being able to uh, travel to... Iran and speak at a, uh, a world conference around um, childhood um, uh, disability uh, activity and, and sport and recreation. And um, just to be able to go to Tehran in Iran and talk to the people who um, have obviously opinions about disability um, and what that entails and, and change the thinking around that. Um, to that point, I would not have been able to have that same impact doing that, um, uh, you know, world conference via Zoom. Fascinating city, isn't it? I was there in 2017. I'd love to go back and explore it a bit more. Um, we've got about uh, five minutes left before our closing uh, presentation. I just want to ask all, all three of our guests uh, a, a sort of a more personal question, really, about your own experiences within sport. Tim, I'm going to start with you. Um, you were a part of the Australian Deaf Football Squad, a team that travelled to Taiwan to compete in... Uh, play for your country at the Asia Pacific Deaf Games in 2015. W what was that like as an experience? Oh, it was it was very different. Um, that's for sure. Um, like I said before, I'm, I'm not a great player, but it somehow I ended up playing uh, centre back for. And you know, our opening game is against Iran, who you know they're a full time program. We're, we're talking. I'm 20 at the time, and I'm facing up against a striker who's double my size and double my weight, and. Uh, <laughs> We got to we got to half time and, and then I remember it's quite funny because in deaf football you have to remove your cochlear implants, which I have two of, which helped me here. Um and so uh at half time you're allowed to put them back on and the coach says to me, You didn't hear a bloody word I said, but great <laughs> job, mate. <laughs> and he, he probably shouldn't have said that because the second half we got beaten six nil. Um, <laughs> Um, but it was, it was a fantastic experience. It was actually the first time I'd ever travelled overseas for sport and you just got such an insight into the complexity of running 
like a major tournament being, you know, I was a player, but you saw a lot of what the coaches had to do. The, the challenges of managing you know, a diverse group who aren't always playing and to do that in like a country like Taipei, which is beautiful, was such a fantastic experience. Absolutely. And you got to put on the Australian jersey as well. You played for your country, which uh, I certainly haven't done. Um, Scott, I, I want to ask you what the interaction is like with Liverpool FC on a daily basis. Obviously, Liverpool are world-famous uh, football club. Um, have you got a hotline to Jurgen Klopp? Does he uh, give you tactical advice and coaching advice? I, I wish, uh, unless he's able to listen <laughs> through the television, no. Um, but the, the club is um, different to, a, I think, a few clubs in this space. They've got a, a department at the club that are specifically tasked with uh, providing uh, support in a business sense and also in an on-park sense um, for programs all around the world. So I, I would speak to them across all mediums. We, you know, talking about technology before, WhatsApp and email, Zoom and the like, uh, I would speak to them almost daily. Uh, and they're, they're very aware, going back to your point a little earlier about the... Um, the multitude of different operators in this space are very aware of, of the risk um, in terms of reputation and the like of, of not delivering something authentic, not delivering something that's that's strong um, ethically as well as from a football sense. So they're, they're in touch really often. And that, for me, is, it's, is a really exciting part of the role. We, we, get, to, uh, we get to talk not just with the, with the club, in the UK, but also other operators around the world, which is really exciting and interesting part of the job. And were you a Liverpool fan before all this, or have you become one? <laughs> no, I was a Liverpool fan. So yeah, uh, for a lot of Liverpool fans, I must have um, a, a pretty, pretty bring it up job. And I, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great experience. I've, I've um, now been over a few times and been able to to experience the, the the Anfield atmosphere. And we're talking about that visceral sense that you get being at the ground. There's nothing like going to those those really those really great grounds and, and feeling it. Um, but, uh, you know, I also listened to your call the other night again, and it was, um, you know, I think back to when I was a child and, and the watching television and think now a big, a big screen and the, the surround sound and, and listening to the, to do commentation it's it's not the same but you know i think that's where we'll see technology as well as in that experience going forward yeah they'll probably get rid of the likes of us it'll, it'll be all uh, fan commentary <laughs> thanks for that uh, Scott. i hope not uh wish wish liverpool all the best this season um so long as they finish second behind manchester city uh murray you get um you get the, the final word i want to ask you um, what are the key attributes that you need um, that made you stand out as, as an athlete and, and a coach in your sport, apart from having a tough nose when that ball's coming towards you at 80 miles an hour? Um, look, I, I was always very thankful for the opportunities that I had. And sometimes, you know, people see uh, people with a disability and think that they've got um, a really you know, big struggle in their lives. And, and certainly there are some struggles um, but there are also some opportunities as well. And um, the opportunities that have come my way to be able to travel the world and represent my country. And as you said, put on the green and gold, there's not a feeling in the world like it. And I'm just very thankful that I've been able to take advantage of those opportunities. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a fight um, through my career to be able to, I missed two Paralympic games because of injuries, um, including Sydney, uh, which is really tough. And so, I think it's that that ability to be resilient and um, you know look forward rather than to look behind you, uh, and and you know I'd say to to students in ACPE there's a lot of opportunities in sport and if you love it you know working in it there's nothing like it um, and so take every advantage of every opportunity that you have and make the most of it um, because uh, it's a very lucky environment to be and I get up every day and just love what I do and and in a position where I can change. The landscape of, of what disability sport in Australia looks like um, is a huge privilege. It's the best job in the world, working in sports. Um, gentlemen, it is uh, 10 to 2, so we're, uh, we're going to uh, close up. But uh, thank you so much to Tim, to Scott and to Murray for being uh, a part of our panel today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.